Poetry Unbound at the Geraldine R. Dodge Poetry Festival. We're very lucky today uh, to have Padre Gotuma, the host of that program, and Patricia Smith together. If you don't know the podcast, um, Poetry Unbound, uh, when you leave here today, you should subscribe to it. It includes some of the most thoughtful, meditative discussions, explorations of contemporary poetry that you're going to hear um, anywhere. They're really quite beautiful. Because this is being recorded for a podcast, we're asking you to be extra careful to make sure your phones are off, are silenced on airplane mode, that if you have uh, papers or aluminum cans or things that make noise, that you put them down, put them away, and don't ruffle through potato chip bags or anything like that. So please help me welcome uh, Padre Gotuma and Patricia Smith. Thank you very much, Martin, and thanks to everybody involved in Dodge for the warm welcome and the opportunity for us to be here today. By way of introducing Patricia Smith, I want to quote some of your words back to you. This is from a poem called Look at Him Go for your granddaughter, Michaela. I know your scars, badges earned in the grave pursuit of science, jump rope whips along a curve of calf, toes stubbed purple, tender uncolored patches of skin woven shut over your small traumas. We're in the presence of somebody who makes the act of observing, the act of noticing, and the act of putting language around what can be seen, whether through persona, or through the news, or through who was right in front of her, or through the poet looking back at herself. We are in the presence of somebody of the most extraordinary skill and extraordinary generosity. Patricia Smith's eight books include Incendiary Art, um, should have been Jimmy Savannah, Blood Dazzler, uh, winner of the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award, the Los Angeles Time Book Prize, an NAACP Image Award, a National Book Award finalist. Also, to add to all of this, because clearly you have more time, um, you have written children's books, edited anthologies of essays and mystery and crime fiction, holding posts at City University of New York, Sierra Nevada University, and the Vermont College of Fine Arts. And in 2023, there's a new collection, Unshuttered, about which we'll hear in a while. Friends, it's a joy for us to be in conversation today with Patricia Smith, and please give her a very warm welcome. Thank you. I'm curious, as we begin, Patricia, what was uh, an early poem or an early poet who captured an imagination for you? Uh, the earliest poet who captured my imagination was Smokey Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> um, and at the risk of aging myself, I used to always go to bed with that little um, earbud. Remember transistor radios that you would put the... The, the aerial up and I'd, I'd go to bed with that little bud and all the stations that I listened to in Chicago would go off at night, you know, and there were some that were, would stay on. And uh, I, I loved Motown because not only if you, if you look at the writing itself, were they written in really true poetic forms, but also they told stories. It wasn't like today where you get one line and you say it 65 times. There was, there was like a narrative arc to, you know, boy meets girl, you know. And then they were always, the men were always begging at the end of it, which I really liked. So, <laughs> so but Smokey Robinson, there were some really intricate rhymes in those, in those songs. If you go back and listen to like Tears of a Clown, things like that, it's like, Pagliacci, what are you talking about? Uh, but yeah, that was, I would say that that was the first time I noticed that stories could be told in a way that was also pleasing to the ear. Uh -huh. And do you think that that has continued to be a major influence on you, that early experience? Yeah, yeah, I'm a really musical person. Yeah. Uh, if you put on, my, my husband used to joke, he said, we should just travel the country, go into these little towns, see if they have a jukebox, bet anyone that you could sing 90% of what comes on. And we just travel the country that way, <laughs> grifting people. I, because the, the African American station in Chicago used to go off, I would listen to these stations out of Chicago, WLS, WCFL, those big booming top 40 stations. So you can toss me the name of a Neil Diamond song right now, and I will sing the entire thing to you. <laughs> All right, and, and it's because I'm, I was always um, attracted to lyric 
and stories. I love James Taylor. I love, you know, I'm always listening for a, a way to tell a story that makes the story look new to me. And music never fails to do that. And for you, and we'll talk about this in a while as well, but I'm curious even to hear as a beginning for you with the absence of instrumentation and poetry, is it implied in the background, in the rhythm for you? Uh, yeah, I think that the voice, because I got introduced to poetry by getting up on stage and doing it, you tend to think of the voice as being an instrument. Like yeah. this poem, I am writing a piece of music. Because when you are performing and the people in the audience don't have the poem in front of them, they can't go home with the book because there's no book yet and look at it later. So you have to do whatever you can do to capture them in that moment. Yeah. And if the story itself fails to capture them, you have to have done something technically with what you're, you know, uh, something with form, something with rhythm, something, you know. So those two things were always kind of in, in balance. You had to have both things so that your audience couldn't turn away from the poem. Um, you're the full band then. <laughs> Why, thank up. you. Yeah, <laughs> you're welcome. I wonder could we hear Should Have Been Jamie Savannah, which is the title poem from oh, the Oh, you want to hear should've it, been, do you? Yeah. All right. So Should Have Been Jamie Savannah, when, when I was, um, uh, I was adult and my mother was just kind of laughingly said, do you know what your father wanted to name you? And I said, what? And she said, Jimmy Savannah. And I went, do you know what a cool poet name that would have been? And I said, she went for the incredibly industrious Patricia Ann. You know? So anyway, that's the story. <laughs> My mother scraped the name Patricia Ann from the ruins of her discarded delta, thinking it would offer me shield and shelter that leering men would skulk away at the slap of it. Her hands on the hips of Alabama, she went for flat and functional, then siphoned each syllable of drama, repeatedly crushing it with her broad practical tongue until it sounded like an instruction to God and not a name. She wanted a child of pressed head and knocking knees, a trip up in the double dutch swing, a starched pinafore and peppermint in the sour pickle kind of child, stiff laced and unshakably fixed on salvation. Her Patricia Ann would never idly throw the Lord's name or wear one of those thin sparkled skirts that flirted with her knees. She'd be a nurse or a third grade teacher or postal drone, jobs requiring alarm clock discipline and sensible shoes. My four downbeats were music enough for a vapid life of butcher shop sawdust and fat back as cuisine, for raid spritzed into the writhing pockets of a Murphy bed. No crinkled consonants or muted hiss would summon me. My daddy detested borders. One look at my mother's watery belly, and he insisted, as much as he could insist with her, on the name Jimmy Savannah, seeking to bless me with the blues-bathed moniker of a ball breaker, the name of a grown gal in a snug red dress and unlaced all-stars. He wanted to shoot muscle through whatever I was called, arm each syllable with tiny weapons so no one would mistake me for anything other than a tricky whisperer with a switchblade in my shoe. I was bound to be all legs, a bladed debutante hooked on lucky strikes and sugar. When I sent up prayers, God's boy would giggle and consider. Daddy didn't want me to be anybody's surefire factory, nobody's callback or seized rhythm, so he conjured a name so odd and hot even a boy could claim it. And yes, he was prepared for the look my mother gave him when he first mouthed his choice, the look that said, that's it, Otis. You done lost your goddamn mind. <laughs> she did that thing she does where she grows two full inches with righteous, and he decided to just whisper, love you, Jimmy Savannah, whenever we were alone, re and rechristening me the seed of Otis, conjuring his own religion and naming it me. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> Thank you. So, like, I'm curious about, you know, were you wearing the sensible shoes or the ones with switchblades? Oh, now? No, back then. Oh, and back now. then? I was really gangly and shy and the typical, like, only child, uh, not very social. My, my mother's way of introducing me to the world was to keep me away from it. Okay. 
So while all people were going out and getting hit by cars and scraping their knees and falling off their bicycles and all that, I was inside and I had no choice but to start reading. Yeah. I, I just, I didn't have anything else to do. So yeah, I was, I was very turned into myself for a long time when I was growing up. Well, and what turned you out of yourself? Uh, probably my father. My father was the frustrated blues singer, the storyteller. He taught me that there were other ways to see the world beside what I was or was not learning in school. Yeah. You know, so there would be people, both my mother and father worked at a candy factory. You guys know um, malted milk balls? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. Well, that's like my family legacy. You know? My mother and father worked there all their working lives, so much so that when my, my mother retired, like two years, you could walk into a room and you could smell sugar on her skin. It's, it's weird. Um, so my dad was the, you know, people who worked at the candy factory, he would tell stories about them and it would be like this continuing narrative, like a little soap opera, guess who's sleeping with whose wife, and I was like eight, like, whoa, wow. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he, he, kept, he kept that up and so I, I, I knew that there was another world somewhere and I knew that there were people whose jobs, whose lives revolved around creating worlds. Mm. And, and that was an amazing thing, uh, especially since I was in a part of town that everybody told you to stay away from. We weren't expected to achieve or anything. And so knowing that there was something else waiting uh, kind of pushed me along. Yeah. I mean, another thing that is present throughout so much of your work is the kind of backdrop of the culture of religious language, you know, unshakably fixed on salvation. and. Her Patricia Ann would never idly throw out the Lord's name mm -hmm. or wear one of those thin, sparkled skirts that flirted with her knees. Religion it's is a It's better when he says it, doesn't it? <laughs> I, need a, I need an accent. I need, okay. Uh. <laughs> I can teach you the Irish accent if you like. Um, I think religion is a very powerful factor in, in the backdrop, in the culture, in, mm -hmm. the, in the language, the vernacular of your poetry. Not proposing religion, right. but it's always there as part of the conversation. Yeah. Uh, religion has been something I've wrangled with for a long time because uh, the way that my mother went about it was, okay, you are you, I am me, here's the church. We're going to be in the church four days a week. Uh, this Only is what's four? supposed to <laughs> This is what's supposed to happen to you while you're in church. Uh, this is why we go to church. So it was always kind of like you are living this life for what is beyond this life. Yeah. And as far as my mother is concerned, she never really looked at where she was. She was trying to teach me there's, there's salvation down the road somewhere. Uh, and so, and I went to one of these, these Hellfire Baptist churches where uh, in the midst of the, the choir was whipping up flame and, and the, uh, the preacher was moonwalking across the stage. And, and then people were getting the Holy Ghost. I mean, they were losing, speaking in tongues and doing, my mother, every, I could just see her eyes get wide. I go, here it comes. And she would be off dancing down the aisle and doing, you know, and, and then they made me think something was wrong with me because it wasn't happening to me. Sure. And so I, I just thought I must be broken or something because the Lord is not entering me in the same way. So it was very much a, uh, it was a big part of when I was growing up and it wasn't until I started writing poetry that I, I thought I have to come to some sort of agreement with religion. And so when you, when you hear that voice comes through, it's a, it's a reflection, it's a part of who I am. Although I'm not a particularly religious person at this point, uh, it, it's so it's so in my DNA, yeah. you know, that this is going to be part of your life forever. And as I see, I watch my mother now, and she's aging and stuff. And and uh, I never really got to talk with her about it as an mm -hmm. adult. But what's happening here? Like I was looking over last night at the group of poets that I know and love and everything. It's that I think if each of us we take little pieces of what we need and we build our own religions. Yeah. You know, and so I, I, I think that word and what word can do is a very big part of mine. Yeah. I'm struck by the contrast in the way that you describe both your parents, you know, one who has the eye to the people in the, in the factory telling you the stories and the immediate present, mm -hmm. and the other who has their eye to the what's beyond the horizon. Yeah, well, uh, my mom uh, was always like the functional parent, you know, not very emotionally giving. 
of just kind of check your grades, comb your hair, take you to church, check your grades, you know. And my dad was the dreamer. My dad was like, and I was with him all the time. And so when he died, my mother and I looked at each other like, and you would be who? She didn't know, you know, she didn't care to know. Like to this day, uh, my mother, uh, and, and she's in the throes of Alzheimer's now, but before that, I would give her books, and when we were cleaning out her apartment, the books were still there, spine uncracked. Um, so she never took the time to connect with what I was most passionate about. You know, I mean, to this day, if the phone rang and my mother was on it, she'd say, you know they're hiring at the post office. <laughs> that was, you know, she wanted this functional, go yeah. five days a week, get your benefits, retire. And, and poetry, the idea of creative writing, was not something on her radar yeah. at all. It was like I was just playing with my life. And do you think that that sense of absence actually gave you a vacuum into which you had to write? Uh, yeah, because when I, when, I when I lost my father, and my father and I were so, so close, that I, I felt I was really blessed to have poetry. I don't know how I would have survived it otherwise. And there's always been a hollow there as far as my, my mother is concerned. So when my father died, and my mother was still the same person she always was, uh, I had to find community. I had to find like stories and other mm -hmm. people. Uh, I had to talk to only children. I had to talk to, you know, uh, black women about their fathers. I had to talk about, and, and, and it's funny how when I talk about a distant mother, uh, all of a sudden the women were coming up to me and saying, I know, I know. And, I, and, and one of the things that this does is like, I thought I was all alone, and how dare you, especially as a black woman, say, you know, if my mother and I were not related by blood, we would not be friends. Yeah. And, and saying that, and having, you know, you go, oh, every woman in here is judging, you know, like that. And then you say it, and someone comes up and says, I need to talk to you. <laughs> And you, you know, know what they're going to say to you? Uh, most of the time, most yeah. Of the time. That, that's, a, that's been a taboo for a long time. A woman does not and not speak ill against, but not yeah. just talk about the hollow that's there in a place where mothers should be, mm. you know. Um, and so that's, have, being in this community has helped me so much because uh, you can read a poem and have, so, this happened many times during uh, Dodge, you know, someone's come up and said, you know, nothing more sometimes than me, nothing more sometimes than me too. <laughs> Do you think that poetry has been some kind of an exploration of self-parenting as well? Maybe especially in the absence after the death of your dad? Um, yeah, I, I, I think my, uh, my need to stay in poetry and to realize that every morning the slate is clean and you can fill it with story, I think that that's my way of paying tribute to my dad. You know, I, I don't, you know, he just crafted these worlds for me, and I'm going, where is this? What's going on? <laughs> and he let me know that that was possible, and that I didn't have to dwell in the make-believe that you can kind of craft the world you want, and then you can go out and find it. Yeah. And when I think about my life, I think I, I get to be a storyteller all the time, and I get to teach other people and I get to learn from some of the best people. Mm. So I'm surrounded by what I love to do, and not many people can say that. Yeah. One of the things that many of your poems are, are praise songs to people, mm -hmm. lifting them up. There's a couple that I was curious about. I wonder if you could read um, The Boss of Me, which is from the same book. Oh, sure. Um, it's not the next one, it's the one after. There. Okay, yeah. got it. And should have been Jimmy Savannah, you okay. know, the, the title poem that you read for us. Right. That whole book is like a, a memoir in verse, but not just a memoir of you, a memoir of, of migration yeah. and moving north to Chicago it, for your it, parents. I called it for a long time, I called it a memoir in verse. This is, should have been Jimmy Savannah. And it starts out with my parents coming up from the south and, and trying to see because um, I don't see many books by people who were kind of first generation north where their parents had all this hope for them and, and didn't really know uh, how to raise a child in the North. And then we were encountering a lot of things for the first time. And our parents were thinking, I moved up South. I moved up from the South to escape racism. Oh, and you came to Chicago. You know, it's, it, it, yeah, so all, all that was. Anyway, this is a, uh, this is a poem about uh, 
my, my fifth grade teacher, Carol Baranowski, who was the first person who told me that I could be a writer in a school where nobody was supposed to be anything. The boss of me. In fifth grade, I was driven wild by you, my teacher, copper pixie with light shining from beneath it, eyes giggling azure through crinkled squint, I let you rub my hair. I let you probe the kinks. I clutched you, buried my nose in the sting starch of your white blouses. I asked you if you thought I was smart. Did you know how much I wanted to come home with you to roll and cry on what had to be a bone-colored carpet? I found out where you lived. I dressed in the morning with you in mind. I spelled huge words for you. I opened the dictionary and started with A. I wanted to impress the want out of you. I didn't mind my skin because you didn't mind my skin. I opened big books and read to you and watched TV news and learned war and weather for you. I needed you in me enough to take home, enough to make me stop rocking my own bed at night, enough to ignore my daddy banging on the front door and my mama not letting him in. I prayed first to God and then to you, first to God and then then to you, then to you, and next to God, then just to you. Miss Carol Baranowski, do you even remember the crack of surrender under your hand? Do you remember my ankle socks kissed which with orange roses, socks turned perfectly down, and the click of the taps in my black shiny shoes that were always pointed toward you, always walking your way, always dancing for a word from you? I looked and looked for current, that second of flow between us, but our oceans were different. Yours was wide and blue, and mine was... <laughs> Thank you. I haven't read that in so long. No. <laughs> Thank you. Like, I love her when I read this book. <laughs> Do you think she knew that you loved her so much? You know, we, we're so, I, you know, I, I realized, and I thought about her so often, and I realized in the midst of some reading or somewhere I was where I thought, I did, never thought I would be, and I looked for her for so long. You know, there were teacher societies and, and all kinds of stuff, and I could not find her. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of... Um, trying to send the message to her. <laughs> I Googled yeah. her the other day. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, she, was, she was wonderful and, and she just never, I was so fixated on, on her and because while all the other teachers were like, you know you live on the west side, you know you're not going anywhere from here. Mm. And she was like, write your, write your story, girl, yeah. just go. And, and told my parents, you know, she said, you don't have her go to this next school, she can go here she can do this, so yeah, she's she is uh, hugely responsible mm -hmm. for a lot of this. Yeah, she gave you some craft advice where you were speaking about that she pummeled you with questions of whenever you were about to write. What does that remind you of? What sound does that color make? How does yeah. that color taste? What sound does that color make? Yeah. yeah, that was a question of hers in fifth grade, you know, and and I was like, what well, colors don't have, sound? you know, and and eventually it's like, you know, when she said, you know. Red sounds different than blue, <laughs> and I and yeah, red sounds angry. Blue sounds, and and so she was pushing me into here's your simile, here's your metaphor. Mm. This is all you're gonna need. Run, my child. Yeah, and uh, and I did. And th there's skill in that in terms of simile, metaphor, and the imagination and language in that. But it seems like it went much deeper into a certain sense of being. Is that right? Um. Yeah, because where I grew up, everybody's focus was on getting out of there. Yeah. Uh, you, you can almost picture people looking out because actually where I lived, you could look down a single street and see downtown Chicago in the distance. So it was like, you're always like, what do I need to do to get there? And one thing that uh, Ms. Baranowski did, and one thing Gwendolyn Brooks did, because you know she said, no, 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 girl, look at where you are. Look at the voices of the preacher and the guy in the corner store and the butcher and the, you know, and, and that's where your song is. Mm. 
your song, you, you, if you go out there, you're gonna have to learn to re-sing your song. You have to learn to sing your song again. Here, it's all around you and you're thinking that you need to be beyond it. And so uh, I think part of um, a lesson every poet has to learn is like there's, there's nothing better than where you are, you know? Uh, and there's nothing better than where you've been and there's nothing wrong with turning around to look at it even though you've paved a lot of it over and said thank god i'm past that moment i never look have to look at it again yeah you do yeah you do you know it, the pavement you think everything's under is like going <laughs> you know and you you go there and you you revisit some things that are beautiful some things that are happy some things that are painful but now you have the language that you need yeah. you know to confront them there's a Scottish poet, Don Patterson, who says that a poem is a little machine for remembering itself. Mm. And it strikes me that you're talking about something very similar and the necessity of remembering. Yeah. Not and just for the point of view of a piece of art, but yeah. actually you need to. Memory, memory is not always pleasant. Mm. You know, I mean, uh, one of the things I think we're blessed with as poets as, is that we have, the, um, we have the ability to address and access things that we all, uh, we never wanted to look at again. You know, I'm currently, my mother, like I said, my mother is, uh, she's in a nursing home and she has Alzheimer's and uh, I, you know, she, I, right before she kind of slipped past where I could reach her, she was talking about being buried and I was listening very closely and she was saying, well, I want this kind of casket and I want this and I want this person to sit in the front row and I want, and I'm like, and, and then I realized, I, I said, that's not going to happen. And I thought, you're going to be cremated. I, you know, and so uh, dealing, with, dealing with that and, and, and where love is supposed to be in that and what's practical, and I can't be thrown back into the, the, the life of your church and people who don't know me and, and your, your status in church and all that. I said, I, I, I want to say goodbye to you personally. I think there's some friends of yours. And, and then thinking, I, I, I need to look at that carefully. I need, to, I need to say, what's behind this decision? Why am I not going all out and doing all these things and having this big send off and all that? And that was a hard thing. I wrote, I have probably about four poems about that. And just because the poems come doesn't, that does not mean you're ready to vocalize them right away sure. because I, you can feel judgment, you know. It's just like, did you hear what she said about her mother? And, um, you know, it, it, it happens. Mm. It happens. And, and, yeah, so I'm trying to kind of rectify that. I know that's, that's something that's coming. There are other things, you know, family, as you get older and you realize you're up at the top of the, the list now, uh, thinking about your own, you know, your own dying, your aging, things like that. And so I just feel lucky that there's some way that I can discuss those things with myself. Yeah. <laughs> That's the primary, the first audience, I suppose, is to mm -hmm. discuss it with yourself. Yeah. And if you can contain that, well, then something yeah. might be containable. You know, you said just now that memory doesn't have to be pleasant. And I'm struck by how that is a through line in some of your works. When I think of the book Blood Dazzler, which pays such attention to what does it mean to, in persona poems, imagine um, what poetry that addresses the catastrophe of Hurricane Katrina and the, the kind of um, the systemic inadequacy of everything that happened reg regarding the response to that. Mm -hmm. um, that is not pleasant. Those are not pleasant poems, but they're powerful. No. Well, what we are as poets, or what we should be, are witnesses. And you can't put blinders on and just, you know, and say, I'm only going to witness some things and not others, you know. And so, uh, and there's a whole other question that always comes up about what we are allowed to witness of others. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've heard it come up uh, dozens of times in conversations here about where's the line, where's the exploitation, uh, how can you write other people's lives, how can you do things like that. So that's a whole other thing. Yeah. But in, in terms of Hurricane Katrina, uh, everybody saw it. I don't think, I, di I didn't really ever think of it as a regional tragedy. I thought of it as a human tragedy. And it let us see uh, just what our country was capable of. You know, there's a lot of things that, you know, growing up in Chicago, there used to be a rumor that um, there were these, these huge housing projects in Chicago. 
And if you looked at them from the sky, they were all kind of in one place and they were easy to see. And the rumor was that, when, that the reason they funneled all the people from the South into this same neighborhood is because if the black folks started to act up, you can take them out from the sky. Now ask me if I believe that. Okay, you know, and so when you're talking about Katrina and the levees and was that purposeful and all that, uh, I can tell some of you guys, you would be surprised what's going on behind the scenes. Oh yeah, city planning is its own. Form. Yeah, city planning is, yeah. you know, so I've, I've always thought about that. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, when Katrina happened, it was kind of like, the same kind of tragedy. People were like, I'm tired of seeing black women being lifted up in baskets. I'm tired of hearing them. Let's get that French Quarter back together, shall we? Mm -hmm. and, and we just wanted things to be palatable as soon as possible so we don't have to dwell in anyone else's loss. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's an issue we have with so many different things. So, uh, but then I think something happened after that. I think it was, um, Haiti and someone said, uh, what, are you gonna write about Haiti? Are you gonna write about, you know, it's like, yeah. no, it's like, oh, I'm just a disaster poet now. You know, <laughs> I write about what reaches me, yeah, you know, totally. and for a reason, and, and I was talking about this at my craft talk. I heard Kwame Dawes talking about it a little bit today. It's like your, your personal investment in the stories of others, you can't separate yourself from that investment. Yeah. You know, so. I wonder if you could read a few from Blood Dazzler, um, Man sure. on the TV, say, and then um, sure. there's a couple more. Everybody too. okay out there? You good? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, this is from Blood Dazzler. Man on the TV, oh, I forgot it goes right into the poem. Man on the TV say, go. He say it simple, gray eyes straight on and watered. He say it in that machine throat they got. On the wall behind him, there's a moving picture of the sky dripping something worse than rain. Go, he say, pick up y'all black asses and run. Leave your house with its splinters and pocked roof. Leave the pork chops drifting in grease and onion. Leave the whining dog, your one good watch, that purple church hat, the mirrors. Go. Mm-hmm, like our bodies got wheels and gas. Like at the end of that running, there's an open door with dry and song inside. He act like we're supposed to wrap ourselves in picture frames, shadow boxes, and bathroom rugs, then walk the freeway, racing the water. Get on out. Can't he see that our bodies are just our bodies, tied to what we know? Go, so we'll go. Cause the man say it's strong now, mad like God pointing the way out of paradise. Even he got to know our favorite ritual is root and that none of us done ever known a horizon, especially one that cools our dumb running, whispering urge and constant this way over here. Thank you. There's, um there's a chilling nature of, of that poem in the sense of how hollow the advice is given the lack of, that, that, the lack that, of provision. That no cars, no way, yeah. you know, uh, but urgent, really urgent. You have got to go, mm. you know, and if someone doesn't come get me, I can't move. Yeah. You know, um, and, and just also years after Katrina. I know that some students who went down to help with rebuilding, and there were still some people who were living with uh, their houses powered by generators outside their house. Years, yeah. Yeah, but the lights in the, the yeah. French Quarter were on and, <laughs> yeah. and bright. You, whenever you speak about poetry of witness and public poetry that pays attention, you also combine that with craft, and I'm struck in this about the use of tiny end stop lines like go, mm -hmm. full stop, period. Um, and you, you diversify the length of line from longer ones to just ones that are like a bullet. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that and what that does to the music? And I almost feel, I feel frightened when I hear this poem. There's fear in me. And some of that is down to the music of stop and then longer and stop mm -hmm. and longer that you achieve. Uh, I'm going to try not to make this answer too long. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, 
the, the coming from spoken word and kind of adjusting my lines for effect when I know people don't have the poem in front of them, uh, and also realizing that that nice flowing poetic line is nice, but mostly people don't talk like that, uh, and, and doing things for emphasis and, and listening to how I read the poem and really wanting you at home when you pick up the book to read it the same way. So, <coughs> sorry. Poets don't often realize how much power they have to get the, the reader to read the poem exactly the way you want them to. Anything from how, it's, how, um, how crowded it looks on the page, the lines you put between, where the line breaks are. Uh, if you want somebody to be breathless at the end of a poem, you, just, you have all the lines together with very little punctuation. If you're writing beautifully and you want them to muse on the lines, you do you know, couplets and you give them air and say, oh, that was, let me go to the next one, you know. Um, so, and, and with this, I, I wanted it very much to feel like real talk. You know, I mean, sometimes we watch the news and we say, you know, what, how, what, you know, and everything's so urgent and on edge, breaking news, this, that, and the other. Um, so, uh, when I talk about a poet's toolbox, not only do I think it's essential for every poet to learn form and prosody, I also think that we need to know how powerful rhythm is, how powerful speech is when we listen to it, and how best to use rhythm to replicate that speech. Mm. Another poem where you do that um, is to a persona poem in this same book, 8 a.m. Sunday, August 28th, 2005. Mm -hmm. A persona poem written in the voice Katrina? of Katrina. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about what persona poem is for you and then read the poem? Okay. Uh, when I, I, like I said, I'm originally from Chicago, and so that was kind of the home of the poetry slam, kind of like a mecca of persona poem, uh, persona poems and performance poems for a long time. And when I discovered it, there were people already doing persona. That was, that was a thing. That was like get up on stage in, in a poetry slam and do persona. And there was a woman there. Her name was Lisa Biscani. And she did a poem in the voice of the man who cuts the hair of people before they go into the gas chamber. And that taught me so much. It taught me that sometimes the most powerful poem is on the periphery. Who would think of the barber as when most people would say, I'm going to write a poem against the Holocaust. Or I'm going. And you're always stronger when you're person to person instead of person to event or person to concept. So I, I, at that point, I thought I had never. And when she finished, there was this white hot moment of silence in the room. People didn't know what to do. And I, I, I had never seen anybody control a room that way. And I said, she kind of moved herself out of the way and had people listening directly to this barber, you know. And so, and, and the first time I started writing persona, everything was persona. I'm going to be a gym shoe. I'm going to be, you know. And it's like <laughs> anything else. When you first learn a form or something, don't you just write everything for a long time in that form <laughs> until you figure out, well, what can I take from this to fold into my own voice? And so in that toolbox with form and all that is, is persona and knowing exactly when to utilize it. Mm. And when I started that book, on, I didn't start a book on Katrina. It kind of, I started writing poems and it became a book much later, a weird series of events. And um, I, I thought, what's going to pull this together? And it wasn't pulled together. It didn't feel cohesive to me until I personified Katrina. And even in poems where she was not, you could see her hovering and watching everything. You know, so when the 34 nurse, nursing home residents were lost and they prayed, and the next poem is, they were praying to God. They should have been praying to me, hmm. right? So it's like she's remorseful, she's angry, she's, you know. So knowing when to, you, to get the most mileage out of a persona is, is, is part of, you know, I'm going to learn that and put it in my toolbox. It's not all the time, but when it works, it works really well. And, I mean, it's a, a certain form of artistic empathy 
uh, with with an idea or with a caricature or with a person. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think that speaks to the human condition? Do you think that that's something that, whether or not you're a poet or a writer, do you think having that faculty of imagination can help you live a life in general? Or uh, do you think of it as a tool for the arts? Hmm. I, uh, what that re it reminds me of another discussion that I've heard here about uh, you know, someone, a woman came up to me actually and said, I'm a, a white female writer. Uh, do I have the, how do I, not how do I get permission, but do I have the right to write about black events or, you know, black people, things like that. And it's amazing how, how tentative we are about things like that, but then we're constantly saying we don't talk enough to each other. You know, we don't, you know, the, the world is the way it is because we don't understand each other. And that's another huge, you know, another huge thing. But I, I do think that even if I don't write anything, I think that poetry has given me a lot of insight into at least being curious about other people's lives. You know, people who have nothing to do with me. Uh, I might never encounter that person again, but oh my God, what do you do? What drove you there? Yeah. Why are you, you know, uh, and, and looking and, and seeing, you know, uh, somebody who is like a greeter at Walmart or somebody who, uh, there's a guy, I, one of the places I teach is on Staten Island and there's a, uh, a bus that goes back and forth between the ferry and school and the guy never says anything. And I told one of my students, I said, interview that guy, right? And they talk to that guy and he knows everybody's business because they're the same people get on the bus every day they don't see him they sit right behind him and talk about everything and he recognizes them and say oh you're the one whose boyfriend is doing you know and 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 I said you nobody's invisible yeah. nobody should be invisible you know uh, I've seen people here no not pointing anybody but the people who you think are service people I've seen them just walk all over people. The people who are here every day ser serving us and pointing us in the right direction and doing that. And stop one time, stop, fully stop. Don't just talk to them while you're still walking. Stop and ask them how they're doing. And you'd be amazed, you'd be amazed. You know, and so it's, it, I think one thing poetry does is like, how are you living your life? You know, no judgment on the life. Yeah. Just how are you living your life? Yeah. You know? Asking. Yeah. yeah. Could we, excuse me, could we hear that poem in the voice of Katrina, 8 a.m. Sunday, August 28th? Sure. <laughs> okay, so this is going to have like a weird sound to it because one of the things that happened with Blood Dazzler is it was adapted and, and we were an off Broadway theater. Uh, it was a dance theater production, and so there's a woman who took a leave from dancing in Wicked on Broadway to dance Katrina for no money. Um, and I see her when I do this. It's like she, she was fantastic. 8 a.m. Sunday, August 28th, 2005, Katrina becomes a Category 5 storm, the highest possible rating. For days, I've been offered blunt slivers of larger promises. Even flesh, my sweet recurring dream, has been tantalizingly dangled before me. I have crammed my mouth with buildings, brushed aside skimpy altars, snapped shut windows to bright shatter with my fingers, and I've worn them soft. You must not know my name. Could there be other weather, other divas stalking the cringing country with insistent eye? Could there be other rain laced with the slick flick of electric in my own pissed boom? Or could this be it? Finally, my praise day, all my fist at once. Now officially a bitch, I'm confounded by words. All I've ever been is starving, fluid, and noise. So I huff a huge sulk, thrust out my chest, open wide my solo swallowing eye. You must not know. Scarlet glare fixed on the trembling crescent, I've 
fly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Can I have like a real quick hand for the ASL? <laughs> Fear, it's, and, and it's like watching, watching your poem through their bodies. It's just amazing. But thank you. You're so, you're so good. OK. <laughs> um, we've never met each other, apart from a couple of emails and meeting a few times this week. I swear. I swear. <laughs> um, so I've worked in conflict resolution for a long time. Mm -hmm. And one of the things in conflict that uh, you know is that people who have been subject to conflict and subject to systemic conflict as well, I'm thinking in the north of Ireland particularly, where the whole system conspires to tell people that they shouldn't believe themselves about how bad things were. And one of the things that always strikes me in these persona poems of, you know, this, this voice of a hurricane that says, now officially a bitch, and kind of announces itself to mm -hmm. uh, unleash itself, is that there is a way of saying your trauma is believable. Um, to speak back, especially in a situation that wanted to move on quickly and say, no, we, you know, the French court is back on, so therefore, you know, we're moving. Yeah, well, yeah. That, that comes personally, too. Uh, each one of us, we know people who would like us to just move along, right? Move out of this space, uh, move along with your life, don't waste your time on things, don't do... So I, I think even in a poem like that, uh, you have to really, I, I think those of us who write poetry and other, other, in other genres, we're constantly having to remind ourselves where we are rooted and, and, and check that root and make sure that it's firm. And, you know, so, um, y yeah, I mean, and no matter where you are, that's a pressure that doesn't stop. Move, you are inconveniencing me. Move, you are in a way, you, you are between me and a place I need to go. Move, you know, you don't belong here. You didn't have the right education. You didn't have the right this. You didn't have the right that. Aren't you from the West Side of Chicago? Aren't you a slam poet? Aren't you, you know? And, and so you, I think what one, of, what one of the things poetry does is reminds you again and again, as long as I have my voice, I have myself. Yeah. Did it take you a long time to believe that for yourself? Yeah, and there and it and it wavers. Yeah, there are some you know you walk into some spaces and it you feel like you're starting all over again, yeah. and you have to remind yourself. I mean, did I ever think that I was going to be in a room when I met Terrence Hayes 30 years ago, that and, and I was like, huh. if I was going to be sitting next to him, talking to him last night like old friends? Yeah, I never never thought. And there were times when I walked into a room and Terrence and other poets, you know, Ellen Bass, Carolyn Forche, are you kidding me? That I had to say, okay, Patricia, it's okay. You belong here. Yeah. You've done, so you've done something or you wouldn't be here, mm -hmm. you know? And so it, <laughs> thank you guys. Thank you. It, it, it wavers. It's, you never know when you're going to come into a place and, and just feel Oh no, it's happening again, and you have to kind of remind yourself of where your where your strength comes from. Yeah, I'd like to talk about your project that's coming out next year. Sure. Um, and so I wonder if you could explain a little bit of it, and we're going to show mm -hmm. uh, you're going to hear a few of the poems. Sure. It's very exciting, and show uh, some photos too. For years, uh, uh, I'm I'm a big tag sale, estate sale person. Uh, when I met my husband, he was, he was into like old jewelry. We'd go find old jewelry, he'd resell it and you know. Uh, but then we started uh, collecting photographs, uh, 19th century photographs, cabinet cards, CDVs, daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, tintypes. Uh, we did for a long time and then I started collecting uh, specifically African Americans uh, at that time. Uh, not many African Americans could afford to have their pictures taken. Uh, many times it was because they worked in the house of someone who was like cataloging their staff. Uh, or there were people who were succeeding and were able to have pictures. So I, I, uh, sometimes I would find whole albums 
And at first I thought it would be great. You see a name sometime and you'd see a photographer in the studio in the city and I would try to find descendants of the people to give them the photos back, especially when there was a whole album. You go, I know somebody somewhere wants this, right? And it's, it's, it's a thankless thing. You, you really feel, you can't, it, most times you can't get it done. I think I've only done it once in all the years we've been collecting. Uh, and so I started using them in workshops. At the beginning of the workshop, I would give somebody a photo and say, all the poems you write this week are tell, gonna tell me who this person is, okay? Uh, and then I would start looking at them and I'd think, oh, your name is, you're this, you're that, you know? And I started to build these lives. And then uh, I got a, um, a Guggenheim, and back in 2014, I got it. And they, uh, my project was to do a series of poems accompanied by these photos, uh, Germanic monologues, persona poems, things like that, uh, and to have it have some sort of form. I'm, I'm still, I still have slam poet in my head so much that I'm always looking, how do I make that harder? <laughs> you know, um, so it, it's, uh, uh, 40 something poems, I think, and in, in accompanied by the pictures. Uh, and it, it's called Unshuttered, and it'll be out in February. Wonderful. Thanks. And um, I, we, I think you're going to read two, and we've sure. got the photos. And actually, I'm curious um, whether before or after each photo, if you could also tell us what you see in the photo. Oh, I'm sure. I'm curious, and we'll have it up as well. So. No um, problem. They're right towards the back of that package of poems. Uh, okay. I, you know I've messed the package up. Oh. <laughs> I've got them here too, oh, if, okay. if that's easier. Yeah. All right, so uh, this photo, uh, one of the places I used these photos was in my workshop at Cave Canem. Uh, and uh, initially, and, and Cave Canem, I'm gonna tell you, like the first time I started to work there as a, a faculty member, I walked into my first class who was in my first class? Tracy K. Smith, Jericho Brown, Ross Gay. <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding? Um, so we all had these photos. And Roger Reeves, who is a National Book Award finalist this year, uh, was in my workshop. And he had written a poem, uh, not to this picture, but to another picture. And the idea for that for this came from that, and I even contacted him and said, I'm gonna do this, I hope I do your poem justice, and I'm gonna try another take on this. And so I thought that just because we're in the 19th century doesn't mean that there weren't people who had questions about gender identity, it was just very quiet, that there weren't gay people, that there weren't, so that was the, the reason I came into this. Conjuring a woman is maddening, such feeble guarantees. I dare first what is needed, the store-bought blouse, its treasured frill and stiff curl of cotton, the bogus bar of gold greening at my throat. I dare sugar in practiced poses while three overlooked hairs waggle on my chin and light struggles through these flawed hillsides of hair, hair oiled heavy and patted toward a quite uncertain she. What a weak and reckless way to step forward, sitting on my hands to quiet their roped veins and ungirled work, hiding blunt mannish nails bitten just this morning to a troubled blood. I hiss suck every air while the button on my skirt strains and my thick toes accustomed to field spread slow purple and ball in these beautiful borrowed shoes. I sit taller, try to name myself crepe myrtle, camellia, burst of all hue. Tell me that I have earned at least this much woman. Tell me that this day is worth all the nights I wished the muscle of myself away. It will take my mother less than a second to know her only child, her boisterous boy, steady pounding at his shadow to make it new. Here I am, Mama, vexing your savior, barely alive beneath face powder and wild prayer. Here I am, both your daughter and your son, stinking of violet water. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, uh, 
the Greek word persona means mask. Mm -hmm. And like in, in lots of drama, the mask wasn't for hiding the truth, but revealing it. And I'm so struck, just this one small line toward the end of this poem, here I am, mama, vexing your savior. Sounds like you, <laughs> especially oh, from what you said oh, earlier now on. He's, now he's like a psychiatrist over here. Uh, <laughs> that sounds like that might be you and your mother. <laughs> well, there has to be some kind of psychological draw to the known persona or even the imagined yes, persona. Yes. How, how do you track that for yourself? Well, you know, what's really funny is how that stuff comes up. And when you said that, I went, oh, my God. You know, and, and I can't say, it, it wasn't on purpose, yeah. uh, but the idea of the many ways I have vexed my mother's savior in my life, you know, and, and revealing, and it has to do with revealing who you truly are. You know, and I could have knuckled down and been the person my mother wanted me to be. Uh, God knows she tried and tried, but I'll tell you, uh, the spirit, when you're leaning in this direction of fi when you find a way to tell your own story, that's a really strong spirit. And you're constantly straining toward it and straining toward it. And, and some people that I know just never got there, you know. But I, I think we're really, really lucky and that, uh, you know, bless my mom and everything. But uh, thank God I found other mothers. You know, uh, other, other people who I could confide in, other places to go where their mothers were the same and we could talk to each other. You know, and if I had not become a poet, I don't think I would have found those people. Hmm. I wonder if you could read another one of those um, poems sure. from this upcoming book, um, Unshuttered, just in case you haven't written it down. February, you say it's coming out. Uh, it's coming out February 15th. And please buy it because it's my only hardcover. I never had a hardcover before. I'm so scared. I wanted to go online and say, save a dollar every week. And by the time the book comes out, you can buy, you know. <laughs> uh, okay. And is there a story about this image? Uh, this is um, a daguerreotype. It's, it's not a tintype. It's not a paper photo. It's had a, it has a depth to it. And the pictures, even though they are black and white pictures, they do have tone. There's like sepia and all that. So the book will be, the pictures will be in color. And this is a really kind of wonderful burnished gold frame. Uh, and I just, it, there's something about her, her blend of assurance and, and, and being tentative. Something about the, you know, I, I know who I am. I don't really know who I am, you know, so. And that, that, that uh, the straight on. Just the straight on. I could be your confounding daughter, wide-eyed in the ways that puff your chest and make you keen to father me, or a sibling curling into sleep, deciding not to see. Your awkward finger hovers, heats, then falls to stray. Let your imagination reckon on my name, obsess on facts a pining stranger seeks. You're not exactly sure if I'm a child, another gangly, immature rapscallion blooming new inside a Sunday dress, or if this coy and luminescent glare suggests the hallelujah of a yes. I can endure your stomach-churning, ill-considered hope. This lure is snagged in history. Allow me to confess the women coiled inside my chest, unhitched from industry, midnight in seething, ageless wailers. Their tenacious clutch is, is all my body is. So when you wonder if your touch will spark a smolder, we say yes. Come here. Come close to me. I, I love how it goes from I to we. I at the start is the first word. And well, I, mean, I imagine because it was so soon after slavery that every time I see a woman, I just automatically will see all these women behind her. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just like a straight path, like how did you get to this space, little girl? You know, and they're there. So a lot of it is when you are looking at me, you are not just looking at me.
Mm. You know, and so that, that idea of strength. And there's some, there's, you know, just like anything else, there's some weakness in some of the personas. There's a strength, there's a, you know, some people are boisterous, some are tentative, They're, you know, some are telling a true story that happened at the time that the picture was taken, so. Yeah. Hmm. We have time for a few questions. I wonder if there's microphones up on either side, I think. I wonder if people want to come up and maybe share your name and then just launch right into your question so we can get as much from Patricia as we're able. Hi, my name is um, Marilyn, and um, it, it, on the one hand, I'm really intrigued by Unshuttered, but I'm also really troubled by it. Mm -hmm. um, confession time, I'm not a poet. Um, I'm a folklorist and anthropologist, and I do ethnographic work. So, I, I, I mean, it, it's fascinating to hear quote, unquote, the stories of the people, but I'm really concerned, and maybe you can help assuage my, my feelings about this, that those were real people, uh -huh. and what then becomes attached to them are these other stories that are really not their stories. Uh-huh. Thanks. Okay. All right, so in... in um uh, Blood Dazzler. There's a, there's a long poem about the 34 nursing home residents that were, were lost, left behind when they thought, okay, here comes the storm. Someone will come and help them, and they're not going to, you know. So my poem is like a camera lens going around the room. I'm stopping at these beds. And when, this, is, this sounds like it's roundabout, but when my aunt was dying, she was in a nursing home. And I was young, I was in high school at the time, but we were all charged with the, her care. And, and um, I didn't really know much about caring about her. And she, was, she had lost her mind, and she was throwing food and feces and stuff against the wall. She was, but every time, there was a, a, a yellow button by her bed, and when I needed help, I would press that button, and someone would come, right? So when I saw that story happening, I thought back and I said, the water's rising, the lights are out, and I can imagine the pressing of those buttons, and, and this time no one is coming. So as I go around that room, I'm looking at uh, the guy who uh, is still wearing his military medals. You know, these are people that, when I was taking care of my aunt, I would go out and start talking to these people. The woman who put a full face of makeup on every day and just sat out in the lobby, you know, whatever. And so I'm saying, and I think the same thing is with this. But at first, I was saying, let me see if I can find these families, let me do this. And when I'm talking about looking at other lives, and this is something that I had to deal with myself, looking at other lives and how valuable it was using them even as a teaching tool. And I'm not saying, and when, I, when this book comes out, after every time I do a reading, I'm going to insist that there's a, a question and answer because this is the kind of discussion that I want to have. I'm not saying this is the only person, only thing that this person is. I'm saying this is a thing that this person may have been. This is, I'm looking at the town that they're in. I'm looking at the photography studio. Some of the poems are things that were happening in that town at that time that this person would have been privy to. So I, I try to move the lens in, in a real way as close as I can. But I also want to say, and, and at the end, there's a poem at the end that is made up of all the first lines of the other poems, and that poem is about what you tried to leave to us and how the many ways that we're interpreting that, and we need to gather your voices again, bring them that back to where we stand, and realize that we are built upon those voices. And it's a, com it's a communal poem. So one of the things I'm saying is, yes, this may be uh, somewhat this person, or it may be your descendant or yours, but let's turn around and look back at them in a real way and say, yes, what she's saying is maybe this person, um, at the time when they lived and in the place where they lived, maybe they saw this event. 
and then you say, oh, that event happened then? Let me look at some more of that, you know? Or knowing that the next time you see a picture from the, the 20th century like this, that you will say, in my head, I'm wild with imagination. I may be right, I may be wrong, but there are voices that I try to typify without getting too specific, but like saying, there were people who were gay. How much do we know? About, so I'm taking the feeling I have from people I talk to now who are having issues, you know, being gay or coming out and thinking, what was that like in 1872? You know, and saying this is a sample of what this voice might have been, but you look at it and tell me what you hear. And, and so it's, and it's something that's going to be evolving every time I talk about it because I need to talk about that because a lot of the work I do touches upon other lives. And one of the things we have to be sure of is when, the, when I was working on the book, somebody had seen, I, this was a story, you may know about it, somebody had seen, because these, these photos are all free use at this point. Someone had seen a photo somewhere, a, a cabinet card or something that was being used, I don't, not in an advertisement or something, and they were like, isn't that grandfather Joy's old, you know, isn't, and, and it wound up being that there were people who knew who that was, you know. And so the story of how I came to the pictures, the story of using them as a teaching tool to get people kind of hooked in their history for a while, you know, which could lead to other places. I'm, I'm thinking there is value in it. There will be people like you or other people who question, like you said, First of all, I have to make sure that there is no argument with the work, with the poems themselves. Because you say, I'm fascinated by this, but on the other hand, and that's what I expect, because there's a little bit of that in, in me too. Hmm. You know? But I so, I'm so glad you were the first question, because that, that's an issue. That's an issue, and uh, that's how I feel about it, and I'm, I'm well aware that there'll be other people who may feel otherwise. And it's good, what's, what's your name? You said you're an anthropologist? Uh, folklorist and anthropologist. For, where, where are you from? Uh, well, here grew up in East Orange. Uh huh. Before that, Kane University and El Vista San Diego Museum of the American Folklore Society. And I wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm glad you're here. Hmm. Other questions? Yes, um, I'm Wendy, and I have a question about Unshuttered as well. So I was wondering, given what you just spoke about, um, a lot of docu-poetry kinds of books, whether they're frastic or not, um, will have a forward to kind of contextualize what the reader is about to experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just curious um, if there's a forward and, and how that, you know, what the content of that might, might say. Mm -hmm. And then also, in these times, if you used any photographs where you had had contact with the families, mm -hmm. did you incorporate any of the stories, anything they told you about mm -hmm. the person, or did you stay away from those photos and use different ones in your collection? Okay, there is a forward uh, because um, it, it's, it's very much what I've said here, very much about how I, how I happened upon the photos, photos thanking the people at Cave Canem for helping me realize what, what amazing tools they could be for teaching, uh, and the fact that there is one photo, I, I don't know where the descendants are, we found that, but, but we found, we would run the names when there was a name written on the back or something, and one, and one we found the son of a man who had spent months in the hollowed out trunk of a tree after escaping slavery. And so, and he, and he was, you know, uh, a freed man. His son lived in Syracuse, New York, was posed there with his wife. And so I took that opportunity to tell his father's story and to have him be, uh, you know, uh, to have him be amazed and have the same kind of tree growing on his property and wondering how his father, you know, how did he face day? after all those months and you know and there was a um there was documentation about the the uh his father fighting off snakes that crawled into the tree uh what it was that he ate sprouted sprouted taters you know and things that he ate so i was really happy to have that information and able to have his son come forward with with a true story and i mentioned that in the 
uh, although we had tried to find the backdrop of so many people that that, that one, you know, a story came to the forefront and we used it. Mm. Thank you. That gave me goosebumps, thank you. Oh, oh no problem at all. Um, we could talk all day, I would love to, and, uh, but there are um, people telling me that we should uh, be bringing this delight to a close. <laughs> um, I love them. Like, yeah, they were a bit more subtle than that. <laughs> it was a gentle waving. Um, a, a phrase that you use a lot when you speak about poetry is, uh, you know, particular skills in your toolbox. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm struck by how, for you, the toolbox is a toolbox box of craft and writing and form, but also a toolbox about what does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean to look? What does it mean to pay attention and to consider what it means to be alive? Um, walk through the world as a poet. Yeah. With how, what does it mean to walk through the world as a poet? We should all be certifiably insane. <laughs> Every time we open a door and we step, before we open the door and we step out, there are stories, lines, poems hurtling at you in all directions. And when you get to the point where you realize that, um, there's nothing like it. Every morning the slate is clean. You don't know what the story is going to be. Mm. You don't know what that line is going to do. You don't know who else lives like that. Mm. Who else lives like that? You know. And so we we are so so blessed not to uh, you know the books and all that. Like I said, I always ask if there were no books and no stages and all that, would you still be writing? You know and. Ask yourself that everywhere along the line. Am I writing for fame? There's nothing wrong with that. Am I writing to move myself sanely from day to day? Is this a recreational activity? Is this keeping me from shooting up a post office? You know, it's like, okay. And, <clears throat> and then realize that it, you have taught yourself the best way there is to look at the world. Hmm. Just, and you know, and it's not easy sometimes because that means you see everything a little bit more clearly and that includes the good stuff and the bad stuff. But um, what other way is, what better way to live than what we're doing right now? What a way to finish. Patricia Smith, thank you so much for thank the brilliance you. of your work. Thank you. Thank what you. a joy to be here with you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys. Oh, and if anybody else wants to ask a, a question or wants to talk about the book or you want to punch me or something, or, uh, I, I would really appreciate that. I really thank you again for that. All right. Thank you, people. Toma and Patricia Smith, thank you so much. And thank all of you.